Oh, I love the little crab on top. Now he's gone. Now oh. he's sushi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everything's good on my end. Do you want to introduce yourself before we get started? Yeah, sure. So my name is Tom Sharp. I am the director of Gossamer Games. Uh, we are a tiny independent video game studio in Philadelphia, and we work on kind of weird, artsy, uh, art-driven adventure games uh, in a similar vein to something like Journey or Flower. Uh, or Abzu, and we actually just released our debut game, Soul, on Steam and Xbox One uh, last fall. And we're currently uh, working on porting the game to different platforms, uh, and also working on some new, exciting, top-secret projects. Very cool. So, um, I'm going to start looking for quick play. Um, and... A lot, actually, if you could, since you're party leader, that'd oh, be yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, quick... Hey, I met him at too many games last summer. Oh, cool. Oh, really? Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of the questions I had outlined for you today are around game design, some recent projects that I was aware of, and then I checked out your Twitter, and yeah. that let me know that you were aware of them too, which was really cool. And so we're going to talk about a couple of those, as well as just like different aspects of game development, steps, things like that. Awesome. Um, so I, I guess sort of the first one I want to go over is since you exist in a creative director capacity over at Gossamer yeah. Games. And by the way, if you if you pause or you need to think because there's too much yeah. <laughs> happening on screen, I don't blame you, don't sweat it. No problem. Um, so I guess where my first question is, like, in regard to starting out and developing an idea with your team, because I know yeah. you come from, like, a very entrepreneurial background with yep. working from students from Drexel, you know, yeah. how, how does sort of artistic design inform game design during that creative process of trying to figure out what the first steps towards a project are? We ended up shifting a lot because we ended up, uh, releasing and launching on consoles and uh, going kind of a completely different direction, uh, like commercially. Um, but thankfully, the design that we've chosen uh, was enough to kind of stand on it, it, its own um, in that space, too. So that was kind of like the, the decision for Soul specifically. Um, we knew we wanted to do a commercial game. We knew we wanted it to uh, originally be on mobile. And we knew we wanted it to be in this type of genre. Uh, so now that we're kind of past our very first production, uh, we're working on really kind of the follow-up. And this is, I think, a really important game because it's going to help kind of solidify um, the creative direction of the studio. And so we're thinking a lot about that. We're thinking a lot about, like, what is the identity of our studio and um, what is what kind of makes us different and special um, compared to all the other amazing, amazing indie games um, and, and developers that are out there on uh, in the market today. So uh, we're still kind of following the same approach of starting with um, a certain aesthetic. And I think I've been thinking a lot about how game designers approach like the initial, like where they come up with their ideas. And I think a lot of developers start with um, definitely like a mechanic, uh, starting with um, you know, if you're going to be a first-person shooter, like getting the 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 shooting mechanics down really tight. Um, if there's any like twists or innovations, um, kind of establishing that really early on, and then building everything else around the mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of doing that, but there's a, a step before we get to that um, that I'm kind of exploring now, which is like when you're writing a story. Um, if you're telling a story about like uh, a guy like slaying a dragon, right? Um, that's the story. If you're looking at it literally, it's about yeah, the guy is going and slaying the dragon. But it's kind of like a metaphor for something else, right? And I think that every good story is kind of like it's it's symbolizing a different type of experience or a different type of story. And what we're trying to do is take figure out what very personal like life experience we want to communicate and figure out how to symbolize that um, and to build all the metaphors that encapsulate the feeling of the story that we're trying to tell. So 
we're trying to like, we're doing a lot of discussions about like just very personal things happening in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and then figuring out mechanically, um, what story we can, uh, tell with that and how we can tell it through gameplay. Um, and then figuring out, of course, how we're going to do that through the environment and the characters and all these things. Um, so it's, it's a lot of like philosophical discussions, I guess. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think creatively, uh, we're just really exploring again things that are happening in our personal lives and trying to put that um, into our games. And I think the more we've seen, we've been really inspired by uh, tons of games that have gone through the IGF awards and um, Indiecade awards and all these things. And I think we're seeing this amazing shift in indie game design um, where you have these creators telling very personal stories. I think uh, the beginner's guide is like the perfect example of this, um, where it's a very, very personal story, um, but it's told through these layers of metaphors. And I think that is really, really beautiful. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we're taking uh, in our current design. What did you think of the beginner's game? I love that game. Uh, I love it a lot too. Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. I, I think it's... Um, it's very brave in the sense that I think it's probably the most candid. Um, I've seen a game kind of talk about the issues that it's talking about. Uh, I haven't really seen a game kind of directly put the creator like in the spotlight in the way that that game does. Um, down to like using the actual creator to uh, to do the voice acting and things like that. Like it's 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 a very brave game. I mean, like when I think about it, I always think of sort of environmental storytelling as like yes. one of its main aspects to it so yeah you know one of my fondest sort of memories from playing that game i'm sure you'll remember it also is uh, sort of visiting the house and doing the chores in the winter yes. area was my yes. personal favorite because like it was the lightest sort of you know only period of calm we really got during yeah. the entire yeah. game um yeah so i guess sort of my follow-up question to that would be you know how do you use the environment around you um, since you know mm -hmm. video games are an interactive medium for storytelling how do you use that effectively in order to convey something that might not have a script like you know soul yeah. for example or monument yep. valley um yeah. things like that yeah i mean that's that's like our biggest question uh because one thing that we've definitely learned is that characters uh are very, very hard <laughs> to create in video games. Creating like believable, um, emotive characters are really hard to do well um, without coming across as looking really amateur or just janky. Um, because you have to worry about the animations and the facial animations and, and all these things. Uh, and we're playing around with some of those uh, like technologies and, and methods um, and we're just discovering like it's very, very difficult. So for us, um, we really do want to be focusing on, I think, environmental storytelling for a lot of our, our narrative content. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I think what I have kind of been doing a lot of research on is just cinematography in general, um, because I think that's kind of a way of, of doing environmental storytelling in terms of letting the camera tell a story. And that's kind of really interesting for games because unless you have like a fixed camera perspective, um, you don't really have a whole ton of control over the camera in the same way that you would with like a movie. Um, You're sort of giving that up to the player to, exactly, to utilize. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still a lot of elements that we can kind of take because I think when a, a director is filming, um, you know, a movie, they're thinking a lot about like the environment and, and how, and they're really thinking, I think about how the camera is framing things, but they're also just thinking about how the environment is set up. Um, and so that's kind of like where I'm starting is just looking at different styles of cinematography um, and seeing like what methods are they using? How are they like breaking up their compositions and everything like that? And then trying to figure out how can we design an environment um, that gets all that stuff across, but while still letting the player look around um, and or if we even want to do that. I mean, I I also really love games that uh, take the camera away from players. Um, I think that's like a very powerful device too. Uh, so yeah, I think just looking at cinematography is the first thing that we're doing right now. Um, and then also, you know, the way that we kind of approach our narratives is we start with, um, 
a it's like a screenwriting tip where you start with a beat sheet. You start with um, we usually use like the three act structure, uh, and it's funny if you have ever studied like the three act structure. Uh, it's incredible because you can look at every single like Disney Pixar movie, um, and you will know like exactly what the plot is going to be, <laughs> right. like, beat for beat. Like it is, it's the same story told over, or it's the same structure, I should say, told over and over and over and over again. But the way that the, the characters are transforming and the obstacles that they're overcoming are, are different. Um, and so that creates like different emotional content and everything. But that's why every like Pixar movie will like make you cry is because it has that formula down like perfectly. Um, and you can like find it. It's like a I forget like how many steps there are in the story, but it's, it's like a very concrete, very uh explicit like this is what the character is going to go through here. They're going to have like a figurative death and then they're going to, um, you know, they're going to conquer the, uh, like the, the bad guy, but you introduce the bad guy, like in the first five minutes of the, the thing. And it has like a very, even down to like, if it's 130 or uh, an hour and a half long movie, they have like the timestamps where you sit down and like can break down a movie very explicitly into that structure. And so we actually are starting kind of with that structure because it's just such a our powerful tool and then figuring out, you know, how do we tell the story that we want to tell with that? And then figuring out what environments would allow us to do that. Um, and so really a lot of the the environment design is kind of inspired or, or dictated by where the story needs to be, uh, like what beats we need to hit with it. Are there any beats that are sort of going around your mind right now that you think would make for an interesting story? I know like when we talked about Soul recently, yeah. you know, initial, you know, aspect of the game was drawing with light. It was, yeah. was sort of like yeah. one of the first topics that we talked about during our first conversation is, is there any like sort of ideas that you're playing around with right now that you think would be good for a game yeah uh so i have like i've actually already prototyped three different games um for our, our next project one is like a vr a vr game that is uh kind of like in direct contrast with what we did with soul <laughs> because after working on soul for a lot of years uh, and spending many, 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 many hours kind of racking my brain on it. Um, I wanted to create a game about like breaking things. Uh, and so uh, I prototyped like a brick breaking game um, that's in VR and it's like a racquetball inspired thing. It's like a crazy arcade, like it's kind of like a uh, Tetris effect, but with like break, brick breaking and it's like just this synesthetic like thing about about breaking stuff um and i think that would be a really amazing project uh and then i uh prototyped another project um that was very much inspired by the beginner's guide and just doing a very candid kind of deep dive into um you know my personal experience uh and the things that i've gone through in the past few years mm -hmm. um so it'd be like a walking sim but with like a really i think unique twist on it uh, in terms of like movement and locomotion um, and then I'm uh, really thinking a lot about time travel uh, as another game and thinking about especially how you can explore the ideas of like predestination and um, like single continuum time travel uh, in a video game that has like agency and all these things. Uh, so I have a lot of <laughs> different <laughs> types of ideas, um, but all of those, again, are kind of like they're rooted in like a personal experience that I've kind of gone through. Um, and I just want to kind of express those experiences first and foremost through the mechanics um, and then figuring out what story we can tell through the mechanics um, and then, yeah, how, what environments would communicate that and what characters and all these things. Right. I, I know you mentioned VR as a possibility for one of them. What do you, Yeah. how, how do you see that being incorporated uh, to sort of further the medium and mm -hmm. sort of further any ideas you might have going on right now? Yeah, VR is super interesting. Um, I I have a lot of like mixed thoughts on like the future of VR. Um, I, I think that it's definitely like I don't think it's a gimmick. I don't think it's you know something that's is like a fad or anything. Right. Um, but especially in regards to like AR and VR, um, I have like a lot of thoughts on kind of like the futures of those technologies. Um, but yeah, I mean, my the one concern I've actually had to put the VR project on pause. Um, in part due to the the virus that's uh, that is taking the world right now, right. because um, using like a shared VR headset amongst the developer team is like 
a really bad thing to do yeah. <laughs> right now. And uh, so, yeah, the VR is just kind of like living quarantined itself in our office. And I don't have access to it. So I can't <laughs> actually work on the VR thing right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, VR is super powerful. I uh, have played around. I've really only played around with... Um, a few VR games like extensively. I love Beat Saber. It's like my my very very, very favorite. Yeah. Um, and I think like in terms of like a, a narrative storytelling um, device, it's super super powerful. It, it lets it adds like an extra dimension to like I think the the walking simulator genre or or just putting you there's that extra sense of of presence um, that I think will allow for really again like personal forms of storytelling mm -hmm. um and so that's super super interesting to me the one thing i've always been from a design perspective i've been really kind of like racking my brain with is i just i'm like fundamentally against the idea of like locomotion in the game not matching up with like real life locomotion like like um, in half like half life alex sort of like clicking to move and things like yes. that okay yeah like I, I know that there are solutions that you know you can do and kind of like ways of getting around that um i just think that like fundamentally that's like i, I want to make vr experiences where yeah all the movements you're doing um with your controllers and with your head and everything like they translate one for one into the environment right. so that makes it really really hard to do like adventure games or any kind of story that takes place where you're like moving through an environment um that is bigger than uh, the space that you actually have to play. So that's like a really huge, huge limitation. Um, and there are definitely like a lot of design things you can do to, to get around that. Um, and certainly there are ideas that, um, and that's kind of where I am, is we're trying to create ideas for VR that, uh, that aren't about moving through environments. They're about staying in one place and looking at things. Because um, I think that's kind of like the natural fit for VR because that's actually what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of like design, I think it's a super, super powerful tool and I'm really excited to see um, what people are, are still coming up with. Um, but that limitation of, of, for me personally, like trying to make sure that the movement matches one for one uh, in digital and real space is, is really tough as a designer. And that's something, I mean, we've gotten tons and tons of comments about um, you know, putting soul in VR, uh, because the entire game is kind of this very, like, personal, very kind of, um, isolating, immersive experience, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree, like, thematically, uh, that makes total sense for VR, um, but again, it's this idea of, like, you're doing, so much of soul is about, like, moving through these environments, and, like, um, you know, the style of movement changes where you're swimming, and you're flying, and you're, um, just kind of moving all around in different ways and how that would translate uh to like a vr experience maybe there's like a design way that we could kind of get around that but um yeah i've always kind of struggled with that the the locomotion yeah i when i think of like one-to-one -one movement in a vr game beat saber is honestly like the first one that comes yeah. to mind like it yeah. might not be as advanced as other games but i get sort of the most out of it if that makes sense yep yep yeah, I mean, I think for um, me that and a job simulator, a job simulator. Yeah. The perfect, perfect uh, example of that. And just to address some things in chat, Dom, we will be streaming the Overwatch tournament later, so that'll be after Smash. And Jay Ober says Ghost Giant and Moss are really great examples of that ah. style. Have you played either of those? I have not played Moss. Um, I haven't played either of them, uh, but I've definitely like had my eye on Moss for quite a while. Um. I wanted to come back to sort of the mobile conversation that we had towards mm. the beginning. I think this is yeah. a good place to do that. Yeah. So what are sort of the limitations that early mobile was experiencing for game development? And then how are they sort of remedied? Because, you know, if we look at the Apple Play market right now, it has things like yeah. Old Man in the Sea, Monument yeah, Valley, yeah. Um, really powerful projects. Um, yeah. What were sort of the limitations you guys were trying to overcome towards the beginning? And what sort of was the market facing overall with mobile as a platform? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just like kind of like a perceived like audience or perceived culture of, of mobile games that they need to be like these very shallow, um, 
like super monetized free to play experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. I mean, the number one challenge I think that any game developer, indie developer is facing right now, um, really, like, I guess any game developer is uh, exposure. It's about discoverability. It's about getting people to see your game and, and play your game. Um, because no one's going to buy your game if they don't know about it. And that's really, really huge uh, in the mobile space because um, there are so many, especially games, published every day uh, on mobile. And it's so hard. I mean, if you aren't, that's always the big risk. Is And one of the reason that we really moved away from mobile initially is because um, if your game isn't featured by Apple, uh, then you're gonna sell like less than a hundred copies. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> right. uh, like you're not gonna reach anyone. Um, and you can be reviewed on like Touch Arcade and Pocket Gamer and, and all these things. Um, but it's it's not gonna matter because you know there's like a core audience of like mobile gamers who um, probably also play like console games and PC games and everything. They're just really into the industry. Um, but for the vast majority of people on mobile, um, you know, they're a very casual audience, which for us is very exciting because um, we want to make very casual games that can be played by like moms and dads and grandparents and like people right. who don't, you wouldn't normally associate with playing games. Um, that is like part of our, our core audience. Um, but it's always a challenge of like, how do you read, how do you reach them? And unless you're, like handpicked by by Apple or Google or whatever, um, you have zero chance of reaching them. And so that was kind of like our biggest concern was like in terms of the marketing aspect and the monetization aspect, um, we felt like we'd have at least a little bit more like control over our destiny <laughs> right. um, going on different platforms uh, for launch. And we still are, are working on bringing the game to, to mobile iOS and Android um, and other mobile consoles too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for us, it was really just kind of that aspect, the lack of control that we had over, uh, getting our game seen. And with Apple Arcade, um, uh, I mean, it's great that the, the, there are these amazing games, um, that are kind of, uh, associated now with mobile games, uh, seeing like Old Man in the Sea and Manifold Garden and, you know, like all these really, really beautiful like artsy games that we've been following personally for like a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to see that those are kind of associated with Apple and with iPhone and, and iOS and everything now. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still, it's still hard because Apple is the one kind of picking those games. Um, right. and, and you can reach out to them um, and kind of have conversations and everything. But um, at the end of the day, they are kind of like, they have all the power. Um, and I don't know I haven't really done a, a whole ton of research now, um, and I don't know if it really even exists because it's still so new, on um, what the market is like uh, launching on mobile not, or, or launching specifically on iOS in the App Store, not on Apple Arcade. Um, I don't know like how you, again, I think you still have the same issues of discoverability. I know they still do like the editor choice kind of things. And right. They do the awards for the games and all, and all those uh, features. And that's how you get on the front page of the app store. And that's how you get seen. And that's how you make money. Um, but it still seems like it's just kind of all under Apple control. And um, that was kind of like, yeah, that's still like a, a huge concern that I have. But it's also like, Kind of speaking candidly, that's becoming an issue that I'm seeing, I think, kind of across the industry. Um, and I don't know if it's if I feel like maybe it's always been that way. And I'm just the more I'm learning about the industry, the more I'm realizing that um, unless you are uh, working directly with uh, an influential publisher um, who has connections directly with uh, PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo and Apple and Google, like unless you have those connections, um, it is very, very hard uh, to get your game seen, and it's very hard for people to know about it. Right. Um, it's, it's, and it's, you know, there was a lot of discussion about kind of like influencers and YouTubers and things kind of helping uh, uh, the discoverability and everything. Um, but we've definitely seen, uh, in our personal experience, having seen like studios uh, have their game covered by really, really big influencers and YouTubers. Um, and actually not seeing and having like millions and millions of views on their games and actually not seeing like 
really any return on that <laughs> right. um, because usually the people who are watching that content uh, are watching it for the personality and not for the actual game um, and don't really have any interest in buying the, the game that they've seen there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's a really tricky thing um, that I don't think is necessarily exclusive to mobile now um, because I think, I think we've seen with Unity and Unreal, um, there are just more games being made than ever before because the tools are so accessible. Um, so I don't think it's just a, a mobile issue now, um, but I think that was kind of the start because it had like the lowest barrier of entry. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I think those are all really great points. One, one thing I want to touch on that you brought up is sort of the artistic development of mobile games. Yeah. Um, I keep coming back to Monument Valley as an example. Mm-hmm. That's just because yes. it's one of my favorite games. <laughs> yeah, I think it here. I think it absolutely like it, it does for me, I enjoy it more on a mobile platform than I do yeah. on PC. Um yes. having a small intimate screen, um yep. being able to use touch screen with it really ties me into it better than using keyboard and mouse. Yes. Um can you think of other examples in your experience where you feel like a game that's being designed to be played on an iphone is sort of better for it yeah um there is a game i think device six is something that comes to mind it's from uh simogo uh i think which is probably one of my favorite um game studios like ever uh they're super super talented mobile studio i think they're actually partnered with annapurna now they also did um Sayonara Hearts, uh, which was on Apple Arcade. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, they have a, a long history of creating these amazing, amazing mobile games that are just custom-tailored um, to the platform itself and really using touch as uh, as a core interface and something that using a controller or using um, like a keyboard and mouse or something, it just wouldn't make sense for those types of games. Uh, there's another game that I'm thinking of. Oh, I can't... Um, is it progress to a hundred or something like that? It's a, a really clever game where it uh, it plays with all the different unique inputs um, of the device, and it's, it's somewhat older, so I'm not even sure that it would fully work. Um, but it, it took an advantage of all the different um, features. It would like know uh, if you're. It took, of course, the accelerometer data, and it would know if you're like holding it a certain way. I feel like at some point in the game, you actually had to like physically make a phone call uh and it would like somehow they programmed it so like it would know that you had made a phone call (laughs) sort of like Um, borders on a alternate reality game experience yeah um but it was kind of like so it's a puzzle game and there's like a hundred really simple puzzles um one i know some of them were like you had to walk across the screen like with your fingers but it would say some things like walk across the room or something yeah you would have to do it like on your phone like with your fingers so it would do and there would there was one i think where you had to like drop your phone or something like <laughs> there was some like really interesting puzzles um that just took full advantage of all the different features that the device offered um because uh, i mean a phone has way more, i mean it's not just a touch screen i mean you can do so many different things with it right um, but it just doesn't really make sense uh, a lot of times to take full advantage of all those things uh, in a game. Um, so yeah, there are definitely like a, a ton of games. And the thing is, I'm sure there are way, way, way many more um, than I can think of, but it's so hard again to, to find some of those games um, out there uh, unless you like directly know about them or hear about them from a reviewer or Apple itself. Right. I, I don't want this to go unnoticed. You're the only reason we've won a game so far. So thank, so thank you for scoring a goal last no time. No problem. I'm trying my best here. Um, I, you know, I, I eventually want this conversation to lead into projects you're excited for and favorite yeah. games. But before uh, we touch on that, I want to get your opinion on a project I saw that I think is like, I, I think for people that don't play video games, they would be surprised to look at this and say, mm-hmm. oh, wow, I can't believe it's a video game. And that's... Mm-hmm. um. Oh, I'm gonna. Despite having a French last name, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. um. I think Doro Donier is so D O R D O G N E. Are Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Is that the one where it's like a watercolor looking? Watercolor. Um, story follows this little girl named Mimi, like picking up yes. like groceries for her grandmother. Um, and I've watched the trailer like ten times. I. Yeah. I love so I love watercolors. I love anything yes. that you know resembles things like that. Um, 
so I guess, you know, sort of my main question is between interactivity and art design. So oh. if we look at something like Gears of War that is gray, red, and green, yeah, you know, you know that once you load into it, all you're going to be doing is shooting bad guys for the duration. Right. Right. Um, so what was some of the concept art, what did some of the concept art look like for something like Soul when you were developing yeah. it, when you were trying to get players in the headspace of what you wanted to, them to experience? Yeah, so there's, it's interesting. There's kind of like two parts to it. There's um, like the actual color is is really hard uh, color is still like artistically i think for me like the hardest thing in the world uh I, like anyone who knows me knows that like i will sit there with like a color picker and just go like, <laughs> for an hour like on a tiny thing uh and just try like a billion different things because it's there are so many choices and it's so hard because you can choose like any color and <laughs> you know how do you like choose color palettes and all these things um it's really tough tough but it's interesting because there's in games there's two things there's like like the narrative i guess there's three things there's like first of all like visually like how does it look um like aesthetically is it does it look nice does it look pleasing whatever um but then there's narratively um color is a huge tool for us in communicating narrative um and then there's also like the gameplay side of, of like functionality um and so from like a narrative perspective uh, my favorite example is I always turn to Wally, um, which I just watched recently. Right. Uh, again, kind of going on my, my very, thing. very topical movie to watch right yes. now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but it's super interesting because uh, in the very beginning of that movie, uh, they like don't use the color green like ever. It's, right. like, it's not e there's not a single shade of green anywhere. Um, it is like a completely limited muted color palette, um, and then there's that one shot of like the plant and it's a super saturated, like super bright green. Um, and so like you can use color, like, and, and green kind of represents like hope uh, in, in the, in the narrative. Um, and so you can use different colors to represent certain themes or feelings or even characters. Uh, like a lot of times you'll see like a character in a movie has like a color, like that's their color. Yeah. Um, and then you can start seeing that like in the environments and things, you'll see like that color popping up and that kind of foreshadows like a character coming in and, and all these things. Um, and so narratively color is like super important. And so with soul, um, we did the same thing where, uh, we looked at, um, kind of what other similar productions did and we did a color script. And this is actually something a lot of movies do as well. Mm -hmm. Um, where they take, uh, it's like kind of a storyboard thing. Uh, you kind of like take a beat sheet um, and illustrate it basically and with like key scenes or whatever um, and you start filling in the colors. And with Soul, we uh, wanted to have the color progression of every level has kind of like a limited color palette. Um, so it starts in like a very pink uh, kind of color palette right. and then it moves into like a purple and then it moves to blue and then it moves to green and then it moves to uh like a warm orange kind of like yellow color again um and so we're actually just going completely around the the color wheel and it it kind of ends where it begins um and so for us that kind of gives a sense of like at least we hope that that subconsciously kind of gives a sense of completion where um, the color is kind of like started in this place and then ended in that place. And it's kind of a cyclical uh, like color device we're using. Um, and so we started in figuring out like, and again, that informed like all the environment design. Because again, you can sit down and like in video games, you can create anything and it can look however you want it to look. Um, and so you can make an environment and then add whatever colors you want on it. And so having the limitation of like, saying, oh, this level is going to be, like, the purple level. Right. Um, it was actually, like, super useful. And then, of course, you have to worry then about, like, the actual gameplay implica implications of that because um, it's one thing to, to be doing color uh, design based on the narrative content and the visual design you want to do. But in games, it's really, really important um, that you use color as, like, a gameplay thing. So that's why in Uncharted, like, everything you can climb is, like golden it has like a yellow like look to it right you have to have like a uniform there's like a vocabulary that you use um using color to identify different gameplay things um it's the same reason that in Killzone, like 
uh, the Hellgas have like the the red eyes, and so like you know that like the red eyes like that's an enemy, right? Mm -hmm. the same reason why in Gears of War like they have like a limited color palette, and then the things that need to pop out are the things that you're probably gonna kill, or the things that you that need to like draw your attention. Right. Um, and so it's using contrast uh, in color uh, as a gameplay device, um, which is really hard to, to balance with trying to do like everything you want to do artistically and narratively. When I sort of think of color in games just as like the most basic concept, you know, the first two examples I sort of think of are Greece, where you're, yes. you're using colors as story points, you're using them as collectibles, you're using them as progress checks. Um, yes. And also Thomas was alone was the other, yes. the other one I thought of, you know, yep. even though every single character is a shape, some of them are the same shape, but just slightly bigger or larger. Right. Um, I'll never forget that Thomas is red. That's who that character is. I don't yeah. need to hear his yeah. voice. I know that Thomas is the red block. Right. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, I, I think it's something that is really great for not only informing creator decision, but also player decision in regard to, like, you know, like you were saying earlier with Uncharted, uh, with Killzone, like these are identifiers for what you need to be doing, what you should be doing. Um, and so it's a really interesting concept that I don't think is, you know, terribly thought of that often. But if you look at like yeah. the Call of Duty series, for example, they all mm -hmm. they all share the same color palette because they all have the same goal. Yes, exactly. They, they've established like this, again, like it's a vocabulary, like a language. Yeah. Um, and you share that across your franchise or whatever because that communicates the player's objective and, and all these things. And that's it's super interesting because that's something that's, I think, completely unique to... I mean, I guess it's not necessarily completely unique, um, but it feels really unique to video games as a medium. Right. Um, that you're communicating. There's, like, a functional purpose to your colors. Um, you could argue that maybe there's a similar um, behavior uh, to, like, cinematography and using colors to, like having like a visual language that you're communicating to your audience subconsciously, but you're kind of doing that in games too. Um, in addition to using it like as a gameplay signifier. Right. Um, so it's a really interesting color is, is really, really hard. Uh, that's why, uh, some of our, our ideas, or at least one of our ideas is, um, kind of very much like Greece where it's, uh, starting with like zero colors. <laughs> yeah. Um, and kind of stripping that away. And that's something I actually kind of wish we would have done in Seoul. Um, we had started doing it uh, later in production, but um, just stripping away all colors, making it completely grayscale, and starting with just like checking the contrast and checking um, like, because that's how you, you determine like, is a player gonna know where to go? Like the way that you usually guide players through an environment is by putting something bright and shiny in front of them. Right. <laughs> that's like, you always go <laughs> the shiny thing. That's like the rule. Um, the bright and shiny thing is like your objective. Uh, and if you kind of like turn off all the color, um, that's like a really good way of just looking at in terms of just bright and, and dark values um, is that coming across um, and then you have because the more color you, it's like noise almost uh, it can has the potential of distracting players and leading them uh, down wrong directions um, and so yeah that's actually a really good strategy is like starting with zero color at all um, and then kind of like looking at the contrast and the composition and the forms and the shapes um, and then adding in color to um, kind of guide the eye and, and uh, add more detail. Right. Um, one more question that I want us to really focus on. Um, yeah. And I'll sort of go first with my... Oh, awesome. <laughs> I don't know what just I, happened. I, I don't either. I was stuck on the ceiling of their oh, goal. Oh, it was one of those. It was one of those. That's my favorite kind of That's shot. That's so cool. Where I just didn't even know what happened, but there it is. I tried to help. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, Jay Ober, it is on Steam. I, I that's a platform I have it on, and he also brings up a game called Hue. Have you ever played that yes. before? I haven't played it, um, but I've definitely seen that game, and it's uh, it's really beautiful. Awesome. I should check it out then. Mm -hmm. Um, one question I want to leave us with is: What is for someone who's never played video games before? Hmm what game would you recommend them to play and then also what are some mm -hmm. what's your favorite project in development right now oh boy and so i'll talk a little bit about mine first so yeah i don't drop yeah. that on you um yeah. 
for someone who's never played video games before, I always recommend Grow Home. Mm. Um, I think, like, in regard to controls, it's still going to be a little janky, but that's still on purpose. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, because, like, when I think about goals and what the player wants to do, if you're climbing to the very top and you fall down at the very end, it's not a big deal because there's all these mm-hmm. mini checkpoints spread about. It's open-ended. It allows you to explore the world. And it doesn't really tell you, like, this is what you have to do. You have a goal in mind, but you really just get to experiment with the controls of the game and the physics of it to really just have fun exploring this large mm-hmm. plant structure. And I think that's sort of what I want. I, I think what a lot of people would want out of video games is just something that's a lot of fun and also engaging. And yeah. I think Grow Home accomplishes that. Um mm-hmm for projects that i'm excited about probably dwarf fortress i know is getting Mm -hmm. like actual graphics (laughs) yeah and i i've never like actually took time to sink my teeth into it without graphics (laughs) so i'm very excited to play it in that capacity nice i'm looking to see if i have somewhere i had a list of like games that i was like I had to keep my eyes on. Um, oh man! Oh, I don't remember the name of that. Um, okay, uh, I'll have to like look up. Maybe you'll you'll recognize the name of the the one I'm thinking of. In terms of like the a game that I would recommend for oh, it's kicked for being idle. Oh no. Uh, That's okay. I'll go back to the home screen. Okay. Uh, I think I don't know if I'm coming back or not. Uh, my thing said I might be coming back. Okay, I'll just wait until you come back to the home screen. I'm here. Um, in terms of a game that I would recommend for everyone to play, uh, I mean, I think my mind goes to Journey. Um, I think that probably is my favorite game. Uh, it's, it's, Spe- it's, it's, speaking it's, of Journey 2, I had like the mm-hmm. ideal first player experience where I had no idea mm-hmm. it was multiplayer. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think for me, Journey, I, it's like kind of a, a toss up, I think, between that and Shadow of the Colossus. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Shadow of the Colossus. I think that's probably like definitely way less accessible <laughs> uh, than something like Journey, but um, I think artistically, both of those. For me, I mean, and that's, but it's hard because the way that I see games, I see video games kind of going into, oh, I've been banned for four minutes. I can't join a match. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We can just talk on uh, here. Okay, good. Um, I see video games kind of branching off into different directions. Um, I see games going into, and they're all like equally valid and super interesting directions. Um, from like a multiplayer perspective, like MMOs and online matches and online role playing and all these things, that's like a, a medium in and of itself almost. Um, like that's completely, in so many ways, it's completely different than like a single player experience. Um, and so I think there are tons of, of great examples of like multiplayer games like that. Um, and then, yeah, you have like a single player kind of like. I think more of like a narrative driven um, experience usually, uh, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think like Tetris is like, like a perfect game almost. Right. Um, but I don't think and it's, it's so hard to compare. Like how do you compare like Tetris to like uncharted or, you know, any of the, like these more cinematic uh, experiences. Like it, it, right. they're, they're almost like completely different mediums because games are so you can do anything with them. Um, and so I think there's like a single player kind of, like narrative driven thing and then i do think that vr is going to be kind of its own branch like vr ar potentially i think those are probably going to branch off in and of itself too but i think that's kind of branching off and going in a completely different direction Uh, i think like pokemon go is like like how do you even like define that as 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 a genre i think i think in terms of accessibility too i know way more 40 50 60 year olds that play pokemon go than i ever thought i would yes yeah, and it, it's an amazing game. Like, the concept of, like, bringing people together in physical space and having you go and physically explore your environments is, like, is incredible. Um, and I think that is, like, I think that's 
genius. I really do. Um, but I think that's again, like completely like, how do you compare that with like, with like Tetris or Uncharted or like an online, like uh, multiplayer, like MMO kind of thing. Like they're so different um, that, yeah, it, I think it's kind of, that's the, the crazy thing about games that uh, I feel like it is kind of unique to that medium because you can do anything uh, in games. You can simulate like any kind of behavior or interaction. Um, yeah, I think that it is branching off in dramatically different ways. And then you even have like, location based or like um like escape room kind of things almost which isn't necessarily a video game but um that's kind of like a game like video game inspired kind of medium all in and of itself where it's kind of blending theater and games and role playing and all these things like it's incredible like the using play which is like this fundamental activity that has been with us like throughout our existence like right. as we're evolving and everything um it is like a fundamental aspect of not even like just being human, but like you see like animals playing and like like baby pandas playing and, and like lions playing. Like it's it's a fundamental like living experience um, that we all do. So it's so hard to like pinpoint exactly like one game that I think like uh, someone should play. But if I had to like from my personal perspective, things that influence me the most probably as a designer, Shadow of the Colossus and Journey, I'd say are like my top two. Um, and so then in terms of uh, the game that I'm most looking forward to, uh, I can't remember. I wanted, it's not Minute, um, but there was a game where you were t trapped in a time loop. Um, and you're going through like the same day over and over and over and over again. And uh, you could do different things. I'm forgetting like, forgetting the name of it and... I hope it's not already out because that would be embarrassing. I don't think it is because <laughs> uh, I feel like I, I heard about it like a really long time ago. And then I think it just kind of went silent and then it came out with like an E3 trailer or something. And then I think it went away again and it's like finishing development. Um, I mean, this, sound, this it, sounds awfully similar to Minute. <laughs> yeah, it's, de it's definitely not Minute. But yeah, it's, it's something in the same vein, though. Yes. Okay. Um, and I actually I never played Minute. Um, Very fun and game. I definitely really should. Uh, but it was about... I feel like the demo that I saw was like the police, like these mysterious, I don't know if it was police or like, like a robber or something like came into the house um, and like killed this guy's wife and was going to kill him. And it was about like living this time loop of trying to find ways of stopping that. Um, and it was kind of like this really cool branching narrative where you would play through the same content over and over and over again. Um, but you would get a, a better picture of like, the entire story and like you would unlock different things based on like how you travel through that loop right um i can't if anyone like knows the name of that game i feel really bad <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that's definitely like very high on my list of uh games that i'm really looking forward to and as we get into our last uh rocket league game yes what do you favorite such a broad term and it'd be too yeah. difficult of a, an annoying question to ask you <laughs> <laughs> but how about over the last year what has been one of your mm. favorite video games to play and if you oh, and if you want me to, to talk year. for a bit while you think i can certainly do that yeah if you have any uh selections let me jog my memory here for a second i think i don't know if it was my favorite game that i played over the past year but the one i remembered the most was probably life is strange mm. um mm -hmm. one I love the band that did the soundtrack for it, which is why yeah. I found out about yeah. it in the first place. And two, it was like, I didn't expect it to have such like a doomsday narrative mm -hmm. than it did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect it to be as powerful of a storytelling experience as it was. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of still have the assumption that when I play a game, I'm not going to get a movie sometimes in terms yeah. of like quality of story. And then I play games like Last of Us, Life is Strange, yeah. um, where I, you know, I get told I'm wrong repeatedly. Um, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think Life is Strange was probably one of my favorites. Um, mm. And I think especially going back to our topic around cinematography, I love yeah. how some yeah. of the scenes were shot, especially. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, a really good choice. I think uh, our artist um, that worked on Soul, one of our 3D artists, uh, that is definitely like 
her all time like top favorite uh game of all time very cool um i don't know i haven't i i think i played the very first um like chapter of life is strange but i don't think i ever finished the entire first uh, series and then of course I didn't play Life is Strange 2. Yeah, um, I haven't played the but... sequel yet, so mm. I should definitely try that out as well. Yeah, I've heard really, really, really good things about um, the storytelling and cinematography, and of course I've I have like the soundtrack that I like listen to on Spotify and everything. Right. So yeah, um, yeah, that that's a really, really great choice. Um, in the past year, man, it's tough. I would say it's also here's a really fun tip about. Uh, game developers and especially myself is I find myself just playing fewer and fewer games <laughs> um, kind of the more because I spend an absurd amount of hours like working in a game engine and right. like, making games and, and even just like researching games uh, like looking at videos on YouTube and like trying to figure out how they're doing certain things and uh, and all that stuff and so yeah it's definitely like it's hard for me to like sit down and kind of like just purely just enjoy a video game now um and i think you'll find that across like most game developers um but i think in my li i have on my phone like my my game of the years uh that i always do and on there i mean greece was like for sure i think in terms of like the games that inspire me artistically um and mechanically and everything i think greece is probably uh, at the very top there. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really loved uh, how that game used color. Um, I thought it was, like, the perfect length. I, I really love, like, short games uh, that you can beat under, like, two or three hours. Um, I'm actually I'm super, super interested in creating, like, micro games that you can play in, like, start to finish under 30 minutes. Right. Um, or even something like, um, like Passage, where you, I think there's, like, a timer where you play that game for literally like only a minute or something, or maybe it's five minutes or something. Um, but very, very, very short games. I think that's super interesting um, because we're kind of like in this escalating nuclear race of trying to create bigger and bigger games. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea of creating something very small but very focused uh, is really, really cool. And I love that. That I think that Greece kind of leaned on that um, because the way it used color and everything uh, in its narrative was was great. Um, in terms of like the game that I just straight up enjoyed the most, um, I think I've always had, I've always loved simulation games. Always, um, I like grew up on like the Tycoon games, the Roller Coaster Tycoon. Right. Um, I actually was shocked to learn we were having a discussion. Like I played like Mall Tycoon and Zoo Tycoon and uh, Circus Tycoon and Ski Resort <laughs> Tycoon. I played all of them. Yeah. Um, because you would get them like in the grocery store and they're like bundled together, <laughs> right? Uh, like in a giant like tycoon thing. I but specifically I learned, remember like, like Scholastic Fair is like oh like yeah. my library in sixth grade yes. is when I would get those yes. games. Exactly. Um, I was it blew my mind to learn that those were like all different developers. That like the tycoon really? thing wasn't like it's not like a franchise. Like anyone can make a game and just call it whatever tycoon. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, because I always thought like in my brain. Roller Coaster Tycoon, Zoo Tycoon, uh, Mall Tycoon, Ski Resort, like all of them were like the same developer doing the same thing. Totally different. Anyway, um, so Planet Zoo came out. Uh, and I've always, again, had a have a huge soft spot in my heart, soft spot in my heart for Zoo Tycoon and Roller Coaster Tycoon. And uh, Zoo Tycoon was like probably my favorite sim. And I love zoos. I love like animals and everything. So yeah, Planet Zoo is, is definitely up there. Um, I think it's probably the game that I enjoyed the most. I didn't like play it um, for like a, a huge amount of time. Um, and the problem, if I do have a problem with it, is that it, the simulation aspects can be like, in terms of like sculpting the terrain, and it it feels a little bit like working in a game engine sometimes yeah. <laughs> because like it's so detailed. Um, and that's the problem I had with Planet Coaster too. Is like it's a little bit too close to home. Um, but I really really enjoyed what they did with that game. Uh, despite like a lot of the balancing issues they had with the economy, um, which I still have when games have like multiple economies where you have like the coin economy and then you have like the diamond economy or like the, in Planet Zeus case, the, the leaf economy or whatever. Right. It always kind of turns me off a little bit, but despite all of those things, um, I still, I love, love, love simulation games. And um, that's probably from the past year, 
uh, my favorite sim game. So I'm going to have to say that for, for my answer. Well, it's certainly not a micro game. No. <laughs> that is, and that's, again, like the crazy thing about games is, and, and what I love thinking about and talking about is how games, I think, really are, they're this completely untamed thing. We're like, when you look at a movie, um, like you, you pretty much, you know how it's going to go, right? Again, it has that formula. Um, unless it's like a really weird art house indie thing um like you have a pretty good sense of like you know what this thing is um and i think with a lot of other mediums that i I use film a lot because there are so many moving parts to it so many components Mm -hmm. but like when you look at a painting or something like you know it's going to be a painting when you look at unless you're going to like again like a really weird modern art exhibit and everything is just nonsense (laughs) which i love (laughs) um but like everything feels very like you know what you're going to get and with games i think it's branching off in so many different directions so fast um that it's still like we don't really know where it's going and i think that's the most exciting part about being a game developer right now is that we have the ability of kind of influencing what this medium is going to be and what its legacy is going to be i think that's a great place to leave it off on yeah um thank you for your time today um are there any social media things you want to make people aware of Yes, uh, if you are interested at all in any of the things I talked about today um, or following our work, uh, you can find us. We are Gossamer Games. It's G-O-S-S-A-M-E-R Games. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, the internet by just going to gossamergames.com. Um, you can find us on Steam. Uh, we have our debut game, Soul, is out now today on Steam and Xbox One. We will have some very exciting news um, that we're going to be sharing uh, later, I think on like Tuesday or Wednesday or something. Um, so if you want to stay tuned to our social media channels, we will definitely be blasting that out. Um, and yeah, we're currently, again, in pre-production for a few different really exciting projects that we are very, very excited to share with you all. Um, so if you'd like to follow our work, uh, you can do it on Twitter and Facebook and all these outlets.